Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carla Acevedo Yates, Marilyn and Larry Fields Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Today, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with Omar Velasquez, an artist that I deeply admire, to speak about the interest and influences that have shaped his Chicago Work solo exhibition at the MCA Chicago, which is currently on view until July 18th. The exhibition features a new body of work, large and small scale paintings, as well as hand carved instruments that address the intersection of folklore, music, and traditional painting genres, such as landscape, still life, and portraiture. Just recently, as part of the public talk for the show at the MCA, Omar and I spoke about the mountain as a creative entity whose shape and mysticism became one of the main ideas behind the show. So for this talk, we really wanted to focus our attention on the concept of artistic influence. It is true that artists shape other artists' work. And in the case of Omar's exhibition at the MCA, it is clearly outlined by the inclusion of two works, a sculpture by Rafael Ferrer from the MCA collection titled Portrait of Charles Darwin as a Fugian Ceremonial Mask from 1972, and a guitar sculpture in the shape of a rooster by folk artist Carmelo Martel Luciano from the 1970s, which we also have on loan from the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture. But there are many other artists and artisans who have also shaped Omar's artistic vocabulary and technique, some of whom we will be speaking about today. Before we begin, I would like to extend a special thanks to Expo Chicago for organizing this talk and supporting our work at the MCA. We're going to be leaving around 10 minutes for questions towards the end of the talk. So please use the fact chat function in YouTube to field your questions and I will make sure to read um, them to Omar during the talk. So let's jump right in. Omar, how are you doing today? All good, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, I can hear Hi. you. Good to see you. Yeah, pretty good. It's been a <laughs> hot and sunny day. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of sunny here too in Chicago, so it's all good. So, you know, for this talk, I really wanted to focus on influence and during our conversations leading up to your show, we have spoken about so many artists and artisans that have been influential to you. And I would like to start this dialogue with one of the most iconic paintings in Puerto Rican and Latin American art history, which is El Velorio by Francisco Yer from 1893. And this painting has been influential to many artists on the island. Um, but can you talk about when you encountered this painting and how it has been influential to you? Well, first of all, that painting belongs to the collection of the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus, which is the university that I attend for uh, my, my um, uh, bachelor on, on, in, in pre-making I was making. My, my, my bachelor on pre-making. So, I mean, it's a huge painting in a very small museum. And uh, it's, it's one of the most, you know, beautiful paintings, you know, I've ever seen. I, I imagine like being a, uh, a very young, you know, um, a student, you know, uh, trying to approach, you know, like history of art and history of Puerto Rico. So this painting become right off like, a very uh, uh, important image. Um, there's a lot of things happening in the muse in the in that um in that painting, but um for some reason uh, I mean we can spend uh, days talking about this painting, but uh, something that grabbed my attention uh, was like in the um in the left side of the of the painting there is a musician playing this instrument. And uh, he has another instrument on this, on, on his, you know, on his side, which are like, uh, you know, it's a, a version of the Puerto Rican um, uh, cuatro and bordonua, which it was like national instruments of us. And uh, it's always been, you know, very intriguing. To see how everything is, everything that is surrounded the surrounding the the, the image, you know, especially if you have. Uh, a little child's corpse in like laying in the table. So it, the, this image is very, very related to the musical history of, of, of the history of music and Hibara music in Puerto Rico, you know? So it's, it's been always, you know, like that. And, you know, uh, important image for us. 
Can, can you um, like talk about like what is Hibaro music and like the instruments that compose um, the orchestra for people who are not familiar with that? Well, yeah, the Hibaro music, I mean, Hibaro is like that, you know, like the, the guy who, you know, like uh, the, the work, the, 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 the worker, you know, of the, of the land in, in, in our, in our, you know, how, how we say it. But um, it's a it's a music that is related to the landscape and it's related to the uh, it's often related to the rural scenery, you know, um, of mountains and and music and 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 food and the celebration of of you know festivity. But but in this case, um, having this tradition of like because you know this painting is the it's the it's re, re, um, narrating basically the death of a child who was like underage. And uh, they believe at that time that if a, if a child uh, was, you know, deceased under the age of seven, he was, he was going straight to heavens, you know, and they, they have a, a tradition of like uh, performing a lot of like bakines, which is a form of, of, of a song that kind of narrates like the suffering that the mother was having and some other, you know, some, there's a lot of, uh, folk imagery, imagery in the and and w what's going on in in the in the at that time at that period. So the artist at that time, uh, Francisco Yer, was you know was a guy who was coming from uh, Paris and and he was having this like you know the the big city life and and coming to Puerto Rico and experiencing the the you know the how the Puerto Rican was. And, and the Caribbean experience, like how is, what's going on? And he basically um, uh, uh, resume everything in under a one giant painting, you know? So, um, but the, the, the music is very often related to the, what, what's going on with the, with the, you know, with the dead child, all that stuff. So. Yeah, I've been always kind of, you know, fascinated with Oyer just because like he's an artist that is so important and influential, you know, not only for Puerto Rican art history, but yeah. also for European art history, which is something that is the lesser known history of Impressionism. You know, Oyer, you know, went to study in Paris. He was there in the 1850s and 1860s and he studied with Renoir and Basile and um, Monet. So like he was really like, you know, constitutive of, you know, the movement that was later known as Impressionism. His work wasn't derivative. Um, he was really part of the development of the movement. And, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, how artists for, for centuries in Puerto Rico have traveled either to Europe or to the US to pursue their, you know, their, their degrees and have come back to the islands such as yourself you know, yeah. to, to work on the island and encountering, you know, when once Oye returned in the 1880s, you know, he encountered um, a very severe economic, social, and political um, situation in Puerto Rico where, where he felt that he needed to address that through his painting. And, and as you know, he was very much influenced as well by Courbet. Um, can, can you talk, I know that you've done a lot of research on this painting and you were speaking earlier about you know, the context of, you know, the context that we're living now of the pandemic and, you know, and, and how that is also related to, you know, some of the, the things that happened in Puerto Rico during the 1850s with, the, with um, another pandemic over there. Can you talk about some of that research? Well, you know, thinking about the, like, the, the reasons why this, you know, like a, 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 a kid would die. So I was, you know, digging through some like uh, information and, and history uh, stuff. And uh, the, the cholera epidemic happened. There was a big epidemic that happened during the time of like 1855 and 1856. So Oyer moved to, um, moved to, um, to Paris like around like that time, but he came back to, to, to Puerto Rico around like in the 1866, I think, or maybe around that time. So it was very interesting how like for now, you know, we have this thing going on about like a, a big pandemic going on and, you know, a, a lot of people dying, but how, you know, like the, 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 the subjects, you know, that almost like 
fit through like almost like a cyclical, you know, uh, pattern in history, how keeps repeating and how artists react to these situations. I mean, this is something that maybe I'm like trying to dig in and, you know, and putting my, my, my actions now in context of, in context with what's going on right now. But uh, for me, it was very interesting how, you know, thinking about that, like uh, the reasons why maybe a kid would die at that time, you know, and the, the conditions of like people were living at that time, you know, and uh, it, it was it was very interesting. And also um, the idea of like, for example, the tiple doliente, which is like a description of the smallest uh, instrument of, of the family of strings instruments in the, in the Hibaro music is a really tiny instrument which was often used um, to sing the back in air. There was like this, the songs for the dead child, almost like, almost like dead lullabies, you know? And it was, you know, if you translate tiple doliente, it's almost like, like a suffering tiple, you know, the word doliente, it's like there's a suffering going on. So all these, you know, um, things that happen between language, image, it's always been, you know, like interesting and, and it's, you know, it's um, infinite, the amount of information that you get through this wonderful painting. And also like what I found super interesting about, you know, how this painting in particular has shaped your work is that, you know, through our art, art history, we always focus on the main scene in this painting, which is basically the black beggar who is looking at the child and then like, the real fit pick begin from the right of the painting and sort of the joy of celebration. But your attention is really focused on the left side, which is this mysterious figure near a door, a rural landscape at the back, you know, playing this instrument. So I really, you know, was interested in how you're taking this like maybe lesser known scene in the painting and highlighting how this painting also describes a history of string instruments on the island. And, and through your work, you're really tracing a type of genealogy of string instruments. Yeah. And um, I know that, you know, you, as a painter, you know, you're also an engraver and, you know, printmaker, but you didn't really study formally, you know, making instruments. And um, if we could go to the next slide, um, I know that, for you, it was really important to, you know, be in conversation and in dialogue with a luthier and somebody who um, was very important to you was um, um, Senor Catalino Vélez, who is from your hometown of Isabela, and is a, a luthier, a guitar maker that you were very close to that unfortunately passed away um, not that long ago. Can you talk about how you first came in contact with Catalino? Like how does this relationship develop over the years and, and sort of the process of, you know, learning how to make these instruments? Well, uh, right about that time that I was like doing my, I was like a freshman in, in college. I met Catalino in a, I think it was in a Christmas uh, party. So we basically start talking about like our, our, our craft, you know, so uh, immediately we clicked and uh, we became friends, you know, and uh, I, sh I was showing him at that moment uh, a couple of my prints that I was making uh, that time, you know, engravings. And I was usually, you know, like uh, doing wood engravings. So there was like a connection with wood and woodworking stuff. So um, he offered me the, the idea of like visit him and uh, basically be become like a, like an apprentice. So he, he showed me uh, how to, the, the basic stuff, like how to build uh, an instrument, especially the cuatro, which uh, I have it right here with me. This is okay. the one, yeah. I made it with him at that time. And, uh, but it was uh, at the beginning of a genuine friendship. And uh, we, it, it, it happened, you know, um, uh, it was something outside of, of my formation in school. When, uh, when I moved to Chicago, we kept in contact. You know, I often visited him every time I, I visit the island. I visited him to his workshop, but you know, he was an old guy and he was getting, you know, uh, his, 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 you know, he was getting sick and all that stuff. And I always, you know, sit down in his balcony, play some, play some guitars and stuff. So, um, when I was in Chicago, um, I, you know, he called me basically, uh, well, he didn't call me. He was very sick. He got like a, 
uh, a heart condition. So, but it was a very heartwarming and, and sad moment when uh, his daughter called me and said, hey, uh, uh, dad wants to talk to you. And I, it was at that moment I realized that that call was actually a goodbye, you know. And uh, it was very, very, very sad at the moment. But then uh, I talked to him and I, I, I told him like with joy, all of my works, you know, and my projects that I was doing at that moment. And it, it, even I was working on some guitars and some instruments alongside my, my painting practice. I was making some instruments. I, I was, you know, following that urge of doing this stuff. And uh, a couple of days later, I, I knew that he, he passed. So, but um, after the hurricane, I visited the island and I wanted to go back to his workshop to see if I can uh, rescue some of the, of the um, tools and some of the templates that uh, he, he left behind. So I managed to, to found some of the stuff and, and, and actually he left me. Uh, it, it's funny because, you know, sometimes you think you're like looking for the treasure but then you find the map, you don't find the treasure. So he left me one of his maps. So I don't know if you are seeing this, but I have a, it's a, a handwritten uh, schematics of a, of, a, of a small guitar and in his handwriting, handwriting and all that stuff. And I kept it like, you know, it's, 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 it's a drawing, it's a, it's a piece of art, it's mine. So it's a connection that we have, you know, so. Um, it, it's been a, a pleasure to meet that guy and cross and that we cross paths. So, so basically, all this project that I've been working, he's been a lot of in his in, in his memory, you know. So he left you like basically like a blueprint, you know, to make some of the instruments that you are making. Yeah. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, this is some of the examples of the of the templates that I rescued from his house from his workshop. And um, some of these are templates for the cuatro uh, instruments. So some of them had been passed through, you know, like through years um, and, and shapes. Usually uh, they're depending on the measurement and the sound of the instrument. So um, it was something that I, it, it was a puzzle that I have to put together. And uh, um, his family, it, he was a very humble man. So, you know, he's, he's a man from the mountains, you know, very humble dude. So, you know, the, the family was honored for me, like to keep these uh, objects as, you know, as, as a treasure and, uh, and, and, you know, otherwise was going, you know, it was end up in the trash or something, you know, things happen, life goes on. So, so it became my template. So I started making, uh, using this, uh, these um, templates and all this stuff as, as my own, type of, you know, like how I began to uh, put together my, my new body of work. So it was almost like a serendipity thing going on there. So in the last slide, you show a space that um, it was like a, a, a small um, uh, space. It belonged to a friend of mine. It's in the south of the island. And that's where we went and, and built all these instruments. So I tried to have like a space which was kind of a... Um, uh, um, uh, a, a place that is connected to the landscape, you know, and, and connected to the, to the, to the, you know, to nature and, and, and making these instruments, you know, so it's, it was very important for me, you know, having that like separate studio practice. Yeah. Can we go to the slide before it? Cause that's, that's the one that we were talking about. So yeah, it, yeah, that's a small, that's a small, um, I mean, it, it was important for me. You're like showing it, you know, it's almost yeah. like, being out of the city, you know, it's like going back to the roots, you know. Yeah, like when I saw this image, it really reminded me of that image of Catalino in his workshop that you had yeah. sent. We just saw because like it was important for you to have like a rural landscape, right? Not to make these instruments in like a city studio or even in Chicago, even when before the pandemic that the plan was to um, make the paintings here you still wanted to make the instruments in Puerto Rico, right? So yeah, yeah. I, it, that was something that I was, you know, going back and forth. And, uh, but, you know, things happened for a reason and everything kind of worked in a very mysterious way. So I think um, I'm, I'm very pleased with how things work at the end. So, so if we can go a couple slides um, over, I wanted to, to know if you could walk us through the process of actually making one of these instruments like from design to like the, the types of wood and, and how do you start building the instrument? 
Well, the idea was like thinking about like, for example, the the instruments almost like were like living um, uh, still lives, you know, like, and, and then I start thinking about um, changing the, the, the shapes of, of the instruments. And I designed three of them um, in, in, in national, you know, like uh, fruits and vegetables that we have in our, in our um, you know, based, based on our things that grow here. And uh, I designed three of them and I went to a local um, um, uh, wood mill and I bought like, you know, local woods that grow here. And uh, they have a variation in 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 in, in the color and how hard they are. And also, the cuatro making has like a a, a, a specific type of woods that art, artisans usually use. So I use um, um, acacia, yagrumo, you know, like um, uh, maho. Um, caoba, which is like mahogany, but these are all local woods. So I start making these um, uh, fruit shapes um, or vegetable fr- uh, shape instruments, having thinking about like those Francisco year uh, uh, still life, you know, with with weird fruits and like guanabanas and uh, avocados mm-hmm. and and stuff like you know, it's often in our folk- folklore of like. Uh, uh, Caribbean painting, Caribbean, you know, like uh, still life, and I was just playing with the playing with the shape and thinking how I can make this playful, you know. So this is more or less like the process. For example, thinking about um, and in this case, I built two tiples and one cuatro, um, and they have a variation in in size and sound, obviously. But uh, there was some stuff like basically I had to um, experience along the way, for example, like how, how to do the bridges and all the specific things of how to make um, the, a functional instrument. So for example, in, in that image on the left, you see a rough cut of a, of a bridge, which is the shape of a, of a lizard or a iguana, you know, some like random stuff. And um, it was a, a also, I, I visited the Museum of La Musica, of like the Music Museum in Ponce, is the Museum of uh, fo- uh, um, uh, Folkloric Music and you know History of Music in Puerto Rico, and I encountered the uh, the instruments of Carmelo Martel, which I knew about, but um, when I when I saw them in person, I had that kind of epiphany, you know, like looking at his instruments and the craft. So I, I start making a connection between my painting practice, the image um, that I was looking for, all this stuff. Plus I went back to my early years when I was like amazed by the idea of like building instruments. I'm a, I'm a Taylor guitar, guitar player. So also, you know, com- like that's something that it's with me, you know? So I start like incorporating uh, uh, snack, like, like, moments of the of the landscape for example that image you have like a, in the in the fretboard i tried to to do using the woods like uh mountains landscape that's something that often happen in the in the luthery you know like in in the fretboard you basically mark you know what the note's gonna be you have dots and stuff like that and uh using the the traditional ways of how you build an instrument, but combining it with my experience, like building them. So it was a very fun project, you know, and I plan to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, it was fun to receive all these images in the process when you were making them. I loved how you stage the instruments and in process in this image that we have here to the right, you can see like a bold fruit. So sometimes you would send me images with like an instrument and sort of like a still life type of yeah. image with like the instrument like laying next to like a bowl of food on your kitchen table. Um, if we can go to the next image, there's like a little drawing, preparatory drawings of of um, of the instruments. But you would also send me um, pictures of the instruments like standing upright, like against like a landscape. Here we can see those images. Um, it's funny yeah. because th- this is the it, it, it's the same place in two seasons apart, you know, and you, you have this very dry 
uh, um, landscape and the other one is so green, but it's, it's just like months apart, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, I, uh, for me, it was very important to, to keep the process as part of, uh, of, I was building a painting too, you know, and the paintings basically came after the experience of me building these instruments, you know, like the, the odd, the odd moments of these objects that were transforming into another thing. And, uh, for me in my OCD, like looking the balance, you know, and I, 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 I like to play the instruments, like looking for a natural balance, you know, and, uh, but it's, it was something that very, uh, a very playful and, 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 uh, you know, like, uh, from, something that comes from your gut, you know, something very instinct, uh, an instinct, you know, so, but, um, yeah, but yeah. even in the image on the left, like if all of you can see, there's like a man, like an old mannequin, like in the brush. And it just makes you like make that connection between like the body and the body of the instrument and also the shape of the mountain and the shapes of the instrument. So just like the staging, so to speak, of the instrument in this way upright also like connects to like its anthropomorphic, you yeah. know, qualities, which I know that anthropomorphism is something that it's very, very um, frequent and sort of a late motif of a lot of your work. Yeah. So let's I mean, see. Yeah, yeah, let's keep going. <laughs> that is it. We have a lot to look at. Um, yeah. Here is one of those images that you had, you know, you take and you sent me about, you know, having like the instrument together with the bowl of fruit, kind of like a still life. And then to the right, we have a pumpkin. Is that correct? Yeah, that's a pumpkin from the harvest from a friend of mine. You know, I, I visited on a Sunday and then I saw this pumpkin, you know, in his table and I, I found it so beautiful and the shape so naturally related to uh, an instrument, you know, like, a, like the body. So I ima immediately, you know, was like, oh, my God, I have to take a picture of it. So the third instrument that I made for the show, it was based on this um, on this shape. You know, I basically mimic this this shape. It was not like, oh, I'm going to Google uh, fruit that, I, you know, and it was actually based on fruits that I had on my or, or, or you know, things that I had with me. So, right. yeah, it, it was very fun. Next image. Okay. Yeah, so that yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's a cuatro. So that's all the instruments, you know, in in their final stage, obviously, you know. Yeah, and and I really love the way that again you stage the instruments, kind of like a still life with fruit, <laughs> you know, and and um, you know having like the raw wood pedestal and that reference to the sort of improvisational, the raw, you know, not unfinished, you know. Um, kind of rural approach that you know you brought to this exhibition. Um, well, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my mom taking me to the not my mom, actually my mom started working. You know, very you know, so I was raised mostly by my great grandmother. Grandmother, but you know, she often we go to the to the to the market, which was like you know like an open market with you know a lot of of of. Uh, um, farmers you know take their stuff and that's something that is being lost with time and with the with the capitalization you know capitalism and all that stuff you know it's something that the agriculture here is not being you know like so active like like a couple years back um and uh, i remember the the setups of these guys like a bunch of of you know like different types of weird fruits or weird uh, vegetables that I never seen. You have some of them with hairy, like the ch chayote, which is like a hairy fruit. And I was always like afraid of it. And I, I didn't want to eat it. And my, gra my grandfather uh, was like, oh, it's so, so delicious. But I had that aesthetic relationship with it. It was so ugly. And I was like, I don't want to eat it, you know. But then when, when it comes to the idea of like presenting the instruments, I wanted to go back to the rawness of putting it almost like they are like, you know, like fruits laying, hanging, you know, like there just to being consumed, you know, and uh, very natural, you know, nothing that um, 
that museum like when you go to to the Met or you go to this uh, museum of they have like instruments collection they present them present them as very pristine untouchable objects you know I want them to you know to be like there you know almost like you can smell the 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 rotting you know uh, uh, and the flies coming on and, and buzzing around the papaya you know so that that's you know uh, in my head thinking about it you know <laughs> So something that was a surprise to me when we installed the show and you, you came and you brought the stand because I'd asked you like, oh, are you bringing a stand for the, for the sculpture? And you brought in this, this incredible stand that you can see here to the right that looks like a rooster's foot. Can you talk a little bit about this stand and like how you made it? Like talk a little bit about, about that. Again, it's, it's just like thinking uh, the objects and the relationship between um, like everything almost like design, you know, in, in terms of like relationship with paintings and how they react. And, and, and I have this piece of wood and, and I wanted to build a, 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 or basically uh, simplify how to present the object. And, and the instruments. And this shape of, of a guitar stand is a very uh, common one, but I tried to give it a little bit of, you know, like an odd moment or a make it a little bit funnier. If it looked like a, like, a, like a bird leg or like a rooster or like another yeah. type of bird, you know. So at the end, I didn't know if it was gonna work. It was something that happened very last minute, but I like to do, I tend to do that, you know, um, let these things happen and, and and let it flow, you know, and, and then end up being um, work, you know, it, it works, so. Next slide. So now we arrive at Carmelo Martel and I love that we talked about the stand because this, the stand or like where he's standing on, like the, the rooster is like a, a Doston maker. <laughs> yeah. It's quite incredible. And, um, you know, we brought this work, you know, from Puerto Rico, it was, incredible loan from the Institute of Puerto Rican Culture and um, an artist and artisan that has been very influential to you. Can you can you talk about how you know you came to know this this artist's work? Well Carmelo Martel has been one of them uh, his, his, uh, his work is very uh, uh, up there you know in terms of like the history of folk music you know. He's been well known. Uh, uh, his most of his, his instruments belong to the collection of the uh, Instituto de Cultura, which um, I knew about his work from you know from doing my research and stuff. But um, when I one of the visits that I did to Puerto Rico, um, uh, I visited the museum where the where his most of his work was, and. Uh, Again, it was something that I was like, oh my God, I had to do something with it. So um, I went back to Chicago. I did a show with Corbett, um, Corbett versus Dempsey and uh, I, I, I built one of the instruments and, uh, but I wanted to kind of, you know, like, you know, do more. So at that moment, uh, the idea of like the, the show came up and I wanted to bring that back. So for me, it was almost like, obligatory having that piece as part of the show and to to tie everything everything like to my work make a reference to my work and also put his work in a context of contemporary artworks you know like it, it's been in, it's, it's it's been made in the 60s like, like mid 60s but his work resonates you know very well in the contemporary aesthetics so for me, it was a very, very important uh, object to be presented in the in the context of the show, along with the with the with the piece of uh, Rafael Ferrer, and um, it was something that I wanted to. I I designed it in my head. I, we made sketches. We discussed the idea, and there were so many other objects that we can probably brought together and, and, and see. But the rooster one was a winner. And uh, another thing is like, as you mentioned, like having that stand that looks like a tostonera, which is a thing that you used to smash plantains and make tostones. I was like dying inside to see if it was actually a, a tostonera, but it yeah. was a, a design uh, object that the, art, the artist, you know, Carmelo Martel 
you know, choose to do. So, and those things were like, were like fascinating surprises, you know, that even at this time I was, I had the privilege to, you know, deal with it, you know, as an object very close and, and, and learn a lot. So, but um, it works very well. Yeah. And, and I know there's also like, you know, a personal story from um, Carmelo that resonates with you personally. Like, like he, you know, he's from Utuado, but he yeah. was in the United States for many years and he came back. Can you talk about, you know, that story of like going to the U.S. and returning and, and what that meant for Carmelo? It was, it was weird. And again, like the idea of like, the, the uh, um, serendipity between like and similarities between uh, the, the biographies, you know, uh, Carmelo, uh, he, he spent like around five years outside of, of Puerto Rico um, and he went to the US to work in the, you know, mid fifties um, and he came back. So around that time that he came back, he was already, you know, um, a beat it you know by by the age and 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 you know but uh he made this series of of instruments and uh at that time i spent the same amount of time outside of puerto rico you know living in chicago and that relationship between the same i'm very you know the things with numbers things that match like the, the same idea why i was talking about like thinking about like oh yeah and the epidemic time you know like some things tend, tend to talk to you you know and um it was something that really really resonated with me at that moment you know that uh, what was where i was at that time so it was very very important for me didn't he say that the mountain was calling him when he returned well, was it, it was more uh, a biography that was made of him um that um, basically the, the person who wrote the biography of him said like his work was very related. He was uh, truth, truthful to the mountain, you know, it was uh, even though that he can make other stuff, you know, like different uh, uh, traditional shaped instruments, he often did this stuff, like it was very related to the mountain. So it was like, he felt like it was a calling and he, and he, was, he was a very, uh, you know, uh, truth you know to the mountain so the mountain as an entity you know and that's something that you know I kept it you know yeah and also like you know putting these two works together you know Rafi, Rafi Ferrer who obviously comes from a contemporary art background and then Carmelo Martel who is like a folk artist or a self-taught artist that is not necessarily his work doesn't circulate in contemporary art circles But at the same time, they share a lot of like formal affinities. Can you, yeah. can you talk about that relationship between those two works for you? Well, I remember when I was the first, my, my, you know, my, my, my first years in Chicago, um, I visited the MCA and uh, I, I saw this show of Rafi and uh, this piece was, stroke me right up right away because it was so raw and so not the things that I, I was used to see about, you know, Raf, Rafi or Rafael Ferrer. I was more like, uh, really, um, uh, I knew about his paintings. I, I, I saw a bunch of his sculptures and, 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 and objects and stuff, but I never saw this, this, this piece. And because it was a snare drum and I tend to collect all instruments and, and you know, and, and drum stuff, I tend to buy and, and collect stuff. And the idea of like seeing this object, it was beautiful. You know, I have that, that the, same, the same epiphany that I had with uh, Carmelo. And um, thinking of the idea of like, this is a piece that belonged to the collection of the MCA. It was a very uh, nice opportunity to put these two pieces together in the same room to create like, you know, like a very interesting context with they both feed each other and they they have some they are both sources of light you know in in in, in the show that are kind of the light that you know I felt you know and it's kind of burning me so that's why I keep these pieces 
in the in the um, outside of the of the the one of the of the rooms, you know, thinking the idea of like a, as a prologue, you know, like something that I for me thinking about paying homage to these these objects, you know, that I'm, I was very intrigued by. So, Can we go and also the... and also Rafi is a, a, a musician too. Uh, aside that he's a, a great contemporary painter and artist, he was, you know, a musician. So having those connections too. No, no, I think that's that's really important. And using, yeah. you know, instruments as a surface from yeah. to make an object. Um, um, I want to encourage people to um, write their questions in the chat. We're going to take questions in about eight minutes. So if you have any burning questions for Omar, please write them in. Um, but I wanted to pivot a little bit and, and talk about, you know, this artist, this image here, um, Carlos Raquel Rivera, the, the, the painting Niebla that I know that has been incredibly influential to you. So I wanted to hear your thoughts about, you know, why this painting is so important for you. And um, how do you see, you know, this painting shaping some of the ideas and some of the things that you're working with in your own painting practice? Well, this painting for me always being intrigued, the idea of like, we don't know what's really going on in this painting, you know? Every time I see this painting, I have a different interpretation, you know, what's going on. And Carlos Raquel was an artist, he was an artist from the 50s and 60s, um, and when I was in college, I was, you know, doing a lot of pre-making and his pre-make, his print work was very, he was a very strong artist, you know, very strong image maker. But when it comes to the artists at that time in the island, you see artists that tend to be very uh, pre-makers and not painters and painters they were not that good at pre-making so this guy was like different and awesome and unique in both in both sides you know but this painting for me it was something that um, I adopted you know in a way of like how to construct and make a, a landscape painting not boring you know thinking about like what what's what's going on in here and keeping the mystique of like what's going on in here. Like you see, like there's a couple like dancing in the woods, you know, and then you see like another person like walking, like almost like in the search for them. And you heard stories about these paintings. So some people say, this is like a story of, uh, of uh, an affair. And some people think that the Niebla, it's a idea of like a bad premonition, you know, by, by Niebla is fog, you know? So basically it's like, a foggy scenario of like this maze of, of I don't know, it's, it's weird. So you, you, you start to see faces in this white, you know, thing that it's almost like taking place of the city, you know, and, and, and you, you hear these stories and it's all about like interpretations. And, but the main, uh, uh, the main characters on these paintings are like the, 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 the green, you know, the, the, the landscape, you know, and it's very uh, odd, you know, and I love it. it. I always been, you know, intrigued by this painting. So in, in my paintings now, I tend to to think about the same idea, you know, like, like make it look like kind of weird, you know, so, but the light is different, you know. But even like Carlos Raquel Rivera, you know, such an interesting, artist in the history of Puerto Rico. I mean, he also lived in in the US, like he studied in the Art Student League in New York. He was, he was in Hawaii for a while, like what, when he was in the military, then he came back to Puerto Rico and, and always had this like, you know, rebellious spirit about him and his work. Um, is that something like you also identify with? Um, as Well, as, he, he's a very strong, uh, 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 his work is very uh, uh, attached to the uh, a political movement. So most of his work has a very political uh, message. But I, the idea of like why I love this painting, it's like, it's not that political, you know? It's about the beauty, I mean, the beauty of the landscape. And it has some resonance. It had the, 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 the loudness of the silence, but you can feel like it's almost like a, a, a silence 
that the silence of the night. But then you have that couple on the bottom uh, left that they look almost like they are dancing, you know, almost like they're dancing a bolero. So there's a, there's a lot of things going on here. But Carlos Raquel was a very, very strong political artist that um, it's, 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 very, um, uh, it's very complicated at that, at this, until this day, it's a very complicated artist, but uh, a lot to learn from that guy. Yeah. Can we go to the, the next slide? Because I, I really wanted to just show a couple of installation images because particularly um, the painting Caguama to the left, like there's like a, a certain resonance with Carlos Raquel and, and how you're building and framing the painting with the mangrove trees to the right and the left. Is that something that, you know, that you're thinking of when you're constructing your landscapes of how Carlos Raquel constructed his landscapes in Niebla? It's, it's funny, I never started that way, and I'm glad that you spotted that little detail, you know, but uh, it's, 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 it's something that is already, you know, like inside of, inside, you know, and sometimes you, you make stuff and you're not literally referencing something, but because I'm so deeply connected to that painting and the, you know, and the Caribbean painting here, it's, it's obvious, you know, like the, the relationship. And it's funny for me, like seeing this, like, as you mentioned it now, it's like, oh yeah, wait, it's almost located at the same, at the yeah. same uh, part of the painting, you know, like the, the, in, the, in, the, in the same position, which uh, I kind of, I'm digging it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right, so we're got, we have a question coming in um, and I hope many more. So how are your paintings influenced by the instruments you build? Do they serve as still lifes in the studio? Um, it's, it's funny, yeah. Sometimes I always have, you know, like guitars and stuff laid on, like lying around in my studio. But um, in this case, the paintings, I, I tend to build instruments that came from the paintings. In this case, that painting that you mentioned um, uh, had that pumpkin um, like guitar shape and I build the instrument after I, I build the painting. So, and sometimes happen that I tend to, to have like weird instruments that I collect. For example, I have one here, which is a, a charango, you know, you have the armadillo stuff, you know, and I, you know, think things that I used to have in the studio and, and having them as, sources of light, you know, so, and, and I think that there's a relationship. For example, in the painting on the, on the left behind, uh, behind the instruments, there's another, you know, shape of, of one of the instruments also uh, pr um, uh, present in the painting. So uh, yeah, they're very related. Um, we have another question. So can you talk about the birds that populate your work? It looks like they are frequent subjects. That's a great well, question. Some, some of these birds are, I tend to choose migratory birds, which are birds that go or, or come, you know, from one place to another, thinking about myself as coming and going, you know, like being a place and not being here, you know. In that case, the, the dog that is in the, in, the, in the painting of the left, it's a, it's a species that was brought here to hunt, you know, like people to hunt in the South. And it become like a, a, a endangered species that, that now is protected. And some of the other birds that I tend to uh, use them in my paintings, I tend to look for uh, like characteristics, you know, almost like physical characteristics or maybe uh, what's the, uh, you know, what, what the type of sound that this bird made or, or maybe it's a woodpecker, you know, uh, that is, is is a bird that is obsessed with, you know, picking wood and stuff like that, you know, making relationships between the, 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 the you know, uh, sometimes like playing, putting into a, a playful context, you know. What about the guinea hen in, in Jokaho BB that we see here on the right? Because it's, it's kind of like a sculpture. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 um, that bird, which is also like a type of, of chicken, right? It's a weird chicken. Um, um, I have weird um, like memories about that because 
you know, the, the farmer life, you know, you have to grow your own food or, you know, kill the animals to, you know, eat them. And I remember me be, being a very young age, probably like nine, 10 years old, my grandfather made me kill one of these, uh, of these birds and my hands were really tiny and not that strong. So I, I didn't do, do the job that well. So I left that bird almost like almost dead, you know, I was like, you know, and having those memories, sometimes when I build these images, I brought them back, you know, and, 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 and they're very, very colorful. So sometimes you, you think to choose an object that will add some, you know, like, colorfulness or whatever you know something that it will pop out in the painting so in this case I choose that 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 type of bird but I made it almost like it's it's almost like a like a sculpture you know it's it's not like a, a realistic um um type of you know um, I forgot the name of the guinea in in English I think it's I think guinea hen I looked it up yeah. Well, we're working on the show. If we go to the next image, because I want you to talk about the two other birds. You know, can't see them very well, but there's like a mucaro owl yeah. on the painting on the right. And then on the left, um, there's another bird that's kind of stuck between like a, like a barbed wire, wire, like a wire. What is that? Can you it's talk just about like that? A piece of, yeah, it's just like he's it, basically that uh, that white bird. It's a uh, gatsa. Uh, I don't forget right? the name. I yeah. Yeah. But she, but he, I mean, it's kind of, 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 you know, stuck, you know, it, it's, it's almost like a, a, to create like a tension of these bird, like it's almost like desperate to get out and uh, you know, thinking about like the idea of like living in an island, some people tend to, you know, feel like their life it's, I need to get out, you know, and, and I like to create that little details on the painting, like, it creates like tension and, and cluster, you know. And then the other painting, uh, I have a, a mucaro, which is like a like a, our owl, you know, our version of a um, like a national species. And it's a very weird, um, um, not it's not off, it's not that common to see it, you know. And every time you encounter one of these birds, it's almost like a magic or a magical, mystical encounter. And I had that moment that I encounter one once. And I feel like I was visited by some sort of like entity, you know, from other space. But probably it was like, I, have, I was drinking too much that night. And, and when I saw it, I was like, oh my God, and, you know. But I, I tend to repeat this, um, these uh, birds and they come and they have like, they're like almost like apparitions, you know, and, and, and they brought some like weird feelings and ominous, ominous kind of feelings going on and, and, and create like a, like a weird uh, world, you know, and, and, and I like these paintings, like thinking that they live in the same universe, but every painting has like a weird separate uh, moment, you know. Yeah, and you can't see it well in this image, but I was surprised when we finally opened the crates and I saw the painting in person because you had sent me images of the paintings when they were packing them up. And I was like, oh, my God, like the body of the bird is a skull. <laughs> so, yeah. like, I always feel like I'm discovering new images that are kind of hidden in, in your paintings, which is it's fascinating because I feel like I can look at them for so long and still find things that are going on there that I wasn't aware of. So we have another question. How has... How has your instrument building affected your music pra practice, if, if it has? Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I mean, I play along with, uh, I have, you know, I've always been playing with people, you know, and uh, now I'm basically making my own guitars, you know. I was, I was making guitars when I was in Chicago, you know, and I was being doing it, but not that often, you know, because my practice is mo mostly, you know, like painting and, and making art and stuff. But um, that's why I, t I try to bring back the, the instrument making as almost like part of my practice to feel that joy also in, 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 in discover new things or new techniques and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I love doing making instruments. Yeah. And you still, you know, play with your bands. like you Oh, yeah. 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 And then uh, it's funny because thinking we, we talk about the backiness and the, and, 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 the, and the beginning of the of our 
talk. And uh, me and, and our band, we put together a bunch of these old backness and we make them in a very contemporary, you know, like more, uh, you know, like heavy music, like more psychedelic, you know. So we tend to move around in my, and uh, how I play with my friends and my bandmates, we have a connection with, with, the, with the landscape. And it's a, it's a music that is always being related to the, to the same idea and the same universe that these uh, paintings and objects live so it's, it's all really it's all connected i feel like it's all like one big practice and i know that many people ask you like are you an artist a musician a painter i feel like it's all related like you can't disconnect one thing from the other like every single part of that you know creative output informs each other in like this one big creative act right um which is which I think it's also how Rafael Ferrer, you know, used to like seize his, his work as well. You know, it's yeah. not- You need to relax, you know, and you need to lower the pressure. So sometimes you feel like you need a place to escape and music have this, music is another abstract language, you know, that you want to conquer, but then you're defeated. And that, you know, that uh, fight is what keeps you trying, you know? And uh, in my case, you know, I always go and, and try to use the music as a, as a point of escape, my own, my own fights, you know, image, image making. So. No, I think that's a, a lovely way to wrap up our conversation. It's always such a pleasure speaking with you, Omar. Thank you. I deeply respect you and your work. And it's been such a joy working with you. I hope we can work together in the future. And I hope all of you can come see the show at the MCA. It's absolutely fabulous. It has an incredible musical soundtrack as well that you can find online. Um, so we yeah, about it, but it was, you know, we didn't yeah. talk about it this time, but it's pretty yes. incredible. So if you go see the show, listen carefully. And um, um, again, all, all the all the songs are related to landscape and still life for some reason you know yeah they one. are and one of them is about a painter pintor right yeah it, it's, a, it's a description of of stuff and it's a, like the point of view of a painter you know but he can paint the painter can paint anything but the love of, of, a, of a girl you know it's very romantic you know so it's kind of cool it is very cool so yeah. Again, I want to thank Expo Chicago for this opportunity um, to speak with Amar and this public program um, and for organizing this event. And thank you all for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.